What's up, everybody? Welcome to welcome back to Eye on the U, the Miami Herald's podcast show about the Hurricanes of Miami. Welcome back to the U itself, being amongst the best in the nation. I'm your host, Andre Fernandez, deputy sports editor at the Miami Herald, joined by our not so new anymore Miami Hurricanes beat writer Jordan McPherson. This show recast because, uh, as you know, Susan Miller Degnan used to be our beat writer. She retired. Now Jordan McPherson has taken over. So we welcome him aboard. Of course, anyone that might have seen us before on some of the Herald shows remembers we used to do the Marlins show together, but now. We're going to bring you the Hurricanes uh, podcast on a weekly basis, and we're going to tell you about all things University of Miami, all things Hurricanes related. Jordan, let's get this thing started. Let's get this thing started. Dre, you also forgot we did the high school show together, too. We can't forget that one. Well, that's why I said shows. Yeah. yeah. That's why I said shows. I said the Marlins, high schools. It's like we've done it. He and I have done this before, ladies and gentlemen, but not on this yet. No, not on this yet. But again, what a great time to start this. Obviously, the Miami Hurricanes football team's off, too. A pretty Tremendous. dang good start. I mean, they're four and zero in the year. They're number seven in the country. They flat out dominated their non-conference schedule with the big win at four at the start of the year. Expected blowouts, but probably even bigger sense of the, just the final scores. What they did with FAMU and Ball State, and yep. then after a close first half against USF, just blew them out of the water in the second half. Two hundred nine points to start the year. It's a school record through four games. Everything seems to be clicking through their first third of the schedule, but. We'll be getting the crunch time in a little bit with ACC action starting on Friday. So now is where the real tests are going to start beginning for the squad. Yeah, we promise uh, not to be those shows that uh, recast the main actors and then kind of take a dive. We're going we're gonna to come back strong, hopefully even stronger. And uh, speaking of that, this, like you said, this program really has taken a step. You're finally starting to see uh, what Mario Cristobal and all those recruiting classes that he's been, all the kids, he's all the talent he's been getting in these last couple of years. Obviously, I've, People who know me, I've got a, I've had a chance to, to cover a lot of those kids at the high school level, and so it's good to see them, you know, making strides, developing, and becoming impactful players at this level now. And uh, but one of the ones that's not from South Florida, we got to start with Cam. We're going to talk about UM's improvement. It's got to start with Cam Ward, and just Jordan. Look, we I, I, at least I've been watching the Canes since I was, you know, probably the size of of this that you're seeing right now, literally like that little bit of, little kid, and. Yes, Miami has had great quarterbacks, Heisman Trophy winners, et cetera. But in terms of just pure talent, pure raw talent, ability, this might this is probably he's probably the best quarterback they've ever had. Yeah, it's a, a fair argument to make, especially if he keeps doing what he's been doing. Four games in, 1,439 yards, completing 72.5% of his passes, 14 touchdown passes, which leads the country right now. His passing yards are second. He's had at least 300 passing yards and three touchdowns in every game so far. No UM quarterback has ever done that through their first four games. Uh, the record is for consecutive games, regardless of when they did it, of 300 yards and three touchdowns is six. He's two away from that. And he just finds a way to make everything work. He's being able to spread the ball around to basically any receiver. It's not just a one-man show. It's not just him to Xavier Restrepo. It's Jacoby George getting involved. Isaiah Horton's getting involved. The tight ends already have basically doubled their production from all of last year. He's getting the running backs involved in the passing game. The offensive line has really kept him up tight, up front, or kept him upright, I should say. And even yeah. when the offensive line does break down, he has the ability to scramble and extend plays and use his feet to, make, to gain some yards if he needs to. But he just he has the IQ, the mental ability, and all the physical traits to do what's needed to be done to – to run the successful offense. And there were even a couple of times I'd look back at the USF game. There were a few times where he was pointing out where plays were going to go to the defense and did it and everything worked. And it's just, he can make the short passes. He can make the deep passes down the sidelines. Yeah. He can get everything in the tight holes. He knows exactly what needs to be done on any given play. And even with all the success, every time we talk to him, he goes, yeah, I did all that, but I missed that one receiver on second and two when it was a slant that should have been a surefire catch. I've got to clean that up. Right. And it's like, you just threw for 400 yeah. yards and you're talking about what the one play you missed. And it's like, that's right. the mentality that's needed at this program, at this, at this level for this team to be successful. They need somebody who's going to, no matter what, find the one fault in his game and basically use that as a chip on his shoulder to keep finding ways to get better, even when he's been one of the best players in college football so far. Right. Because really, yeah, when you look at it, I mean, this start is amazing. Don't get me wrong. But... 
look who it's come against. I mean, and yeah. I think the fact that they're aware of that, I mean, let's take the two sides of that because in the past, some of these teams on this schedule, you might have probably seen Miami have a hiccup at some point, especially last week, falling behind in the first half yeah. on the road. That's the kind of game that could have gotten dicey in the past, but this team put its foot down, smashed them in the second half, did what they needed to do, and that's the difference right there. As you see, this team is just taking care of business against these overmatched opponents, and they're really, if you look at the rest of the schedule, for the, the majority of the rest of the schedule, it's going to be that way. They're going to face a lot of these teams that they're going to go in, and that's what they should do. Based on the talent they have, assuming everyone's healthy, that's what they should do. But going back to Cam Ward, it's not just the scrambling I think it's pocket presence, too, because yes. look at him I, I, more, several times this year. I mean, he blew me away with the play at Florida, the one where he rolled to his left and across the field in the back of the end zone. But it was it, people, I think, look at the at the at the rollout and the throw. I look at the fact that he's able to sense the pressure. Yes. And my had a lot of quarterbacks in, in for a while now that can do that on a regular basis. And I think that's one of the key traits that he has that makes him that next level guy that if they are going to, you know, seventh in the country right now, if they really are going to compete, should they get to the point where they can win an ACC title? Should they get in the playoff as, as they're looking like they could be this year? Can they not just get there? Can they compete with some of the top five teams in the country? Ward's the difference maker. Yeah, no doubt about it. There's no difference. Again, college football, it's, if you have the quarterback, you have a chance. If you don't have a quarterback, almost everything else has to go perfect, and your opponent's going to need to have a hiccup or two. But yeah. quarterback sets the tone in college football, and Ward is just, again, he's been playing next level with this, and he knows where he's going. He knows what he has to do. And the fact that he was able to do all of this, again, he just came in this spring. He's been with this team. He's only been with them for about six months now, six, seven right. months. So the fact that he not only has the command of the offense – the complete understanding of the playbook, but he has the complete and utter trust of every single player in that locker room. The fact right. that he was able to hone that in and basically get it from day one, just not because he walked in and went, okay, I'm the quarterback. I'm going to, you guys have to listen to what I say. He earned their trust with the way he went through practice, the way that he went all out with every single drill he does and the way he was able to build chemistry with everyone away from the field. I mean, he took his offensive lineman out for dinner multiple times from what we were told. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not a cheap thing to be able to do with your offensive lineman. Uh, but he was able to find different ways to build the chemistry, build the trust, build the relationships, so that when everything came down to it on Saturdays, when it matters the most, and Cam Ward says, I got you, they know that they, mm -hmm. they know that he's got them. Yeah, and with each win, that trust is going to continue. With each play he makes, with each victory they get, that's just going to continue to go on and on. But, um, you know, we could spend most of the episode talking about Cam Ward, and we probably will a lot of episodes, but we want to talk a little bit about some of the other guys that have impressed. You know, I know you mentioned the tight end group has, has stepped up and really been better than it has been in recent years. Obviously, both lines of scrimmage have played, for the most part, really well. Safety, Mish, Mish Powell on defense, he's had a good year. I mean, I think he's impressed a lot. I, I and, and Restrepo, I know he's been there for a bit, but this season you're really starting to see that having a quarterback like Ward has really allowed him to really break out. And, and what a milestone, too. 2,000 yards. When you look at – I'm talking about – I started the show talking about quarterback tradition at Miami. Receiver tradition Miami is not far behind, if at all. Restrepo's put his name right above, right up there with a lot of the greats. Yeah, and I'll start with Restrepo and work my way back. Restrepo, he's the 10th player in UM history with 2,000 receiving yards in his career. He's only about 500 yards and about 35-ish catches away from having the UM school record for career catches, which he would pass Mike Harley for that, and receiving yards, which he would pass Santana Moss for that. Again, you've got guys like him. you got Reggie Wayne. you got Andre Johnson. You've got all of these big names who played at the U. And Xavier Restrepo has a very good chance of topping all of them in terms of what he does in his UM career. And a lot of that's just coming from last year and this year. Last year, he breaks a thousand yard. He breaks a thousand yard mark. This year, he's already up to about 300, 300 and something. And again, it's just the way that he's built himself. He's a fifth year guy, didn't play much his first year. His second year was the COVID year, so it was a limited schedule. And then 2022, you start to see him kind of start breaking through. And then he became the guy in the slot last year. And he's continued that. And it's just, he's not the fastest guy. He's not the biggest guy. But when he runs his routes, he's as crisp as can be. He's one of the most polished route runners this team has. And mm. any ball that gets near his vicinity, he has a pretty dang good chance of catching it. 
So he's been one of war, he's been Ward's biggest safety net, but Ward has been able to stretch, spread the ball to everybody. I believe when I look up numbers after last week, it was six or seven guys already have at least 100 yards and a touchdown through four games. Three different guys have at least one 100 yard receiving game. And it's just being able to spread the ball and know that every guy who they throw to, whether it's whether it is Restrepo, Jacoby George, Isaiah Horton, even the tight ends, Elijah Arroyo and uh, Elijah Lofton, when they catch the ball, they have the chance for an explosive to play. They can get yards after the catch. So when you have six, seven, eight legitimate threats, it makes it hard for any defense just honing on one, which helps Ward out even more, knowing he can throw it to – he basically has a lot of one-on-one right. matchups with all these big guys. Right. No, so, going back – yeah, yeah. I, I just think Restrepo, too, like just the – his – he looks like a guy – I mean, when you look at the NFL – Yak is huge on any yes. offense in the NFL, and he is so good at not just separating, not just finding the seam. I mean, when Ward's in throw to spots, but breaking a, a, an in-between play into a big play, too. And his projectability just looks good right now, like I think, to, for the next level. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about that. And again, he's just – he shows up every week. He's been – one of my favorite guys to watch on this team. Uh, to round out to a few of the other guys, uh, the lines of scrimmage, uh, I want to talk about both of those mainly because – both of them have been without two of their most important players all season. Right. Jalen Rivers or Ruben Bain has only played one defensive series. He only played three, three or four snaps at Florida. And Jalen Rivers started that Florida game, played that start to finish. They haven't been back on the field since. They're supposed, Mario Cristobal said there's a chance they both return for the Virginia Tech game on Friday. But the fact that both of those lines of scrimmage without their starting left tackle and without their potential All American defensive end. They've still been doing great. I mean, the offensive line's kept Ward upright. They've only allowed three sacks this year, which is, I think, in the top 10 nationally. The defensive line is leading the country in sacks. It's in the top five in tackles for loss. And they've been doing it with the defensive line specifically. They're just rotating guys around. They're using eight, nine, 10, 11 guys, and there's no drop off. You look at the defensive ends, Tyler Barron, who came in from Tennessee, and Elijah Alston, who transferred in as well this offseason. They've been holding on defensive ends. Tyler Barron's having a fantastic year. You look at defensive tackles, you've got Akeem Mesador, who's coming off the foot injury from last year. He's playing both inside and out. Uh, Simeon Barrow, who transferred in from Michigan State, is working out, working out great. They have they really hit well on the portal this year, and a couple of their younger guys have stepped up as well. And on the offensive line, everybody else who is expected to be a starter has been great. I mean, you've got at left guard, you've got Matt McCoy, who has taken over that spot. Uh, Zach, or yeah, Zach, uh, wow, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, their center, Zach Carpenter from Indiana. Carpenter, that's right. Yeah, Zach Carpenter from Indiana took over at center. He's been doing great. His his relationship with Ward when it comes to making checks at the line of scrimmage has been outstanding. Uh, Inez Cooper continues to grow right guard, and Francis Maui Noah at right tackle, freshman All American last year, looking like not just the best offensive lineman on this team and in the ACC, but he's grading out as one of the best offensive linemen in the country as a sophomore. And we saw a lot of potential from him last year, and he's just continuing to grow this year. So when you add Jalen Rivers back into that mix, Markel Bell has started the last three games. He's held his own, but he has been, understandably, the weak point. He was the number six, number seven guy on this line. But when you were able to bring Jalen Rivers back, that's just going to solidify that group that much more. Right. Well, and just looking overall, you know, oh, we wanted to talk a little bit on the defensive side, you know, a little bit about Powell. I mean, yeah. and, and the season he's had, I mean, he, really stepping up on that yeah. side of the ball. Tell me a little about what, how's Misha look to you? Yeah, Misha looked really good. He has two interceptions. The main thing for me is the the for the Miami Hurricanes, their defense runs through their safeties. Their communication runs through the safeties. So Misha Powell, who transferred him from Washington, he was on that national champion runner-up team last year. So he knows what it takes to get to a national championship. He knows what qualities and characteristics fit in for a national championship team to be successful. So he's brought that perspective in and also the fact that as just like Ward, he's a new guy coming in and he quickly established himself as one of the leaders on this defense. He's a vocal guy. He knows how to, he knows how to watch checks. He knows how to make calls. He knows how to make adjustments at the line. He knows what needs to be done and he stepped up and he's one of the guys bring, he's bringing a lot of energy to the team. I mean, you watch what he did after his two interceptions, the one at Florida, which was in the third quarter was still, Game was still pretty close. He intercepts, runs down the line, and then gives the emphatic Gator chomp to the fans. Uh, does a big dance move after his interception in the in the game against USF that was originally called. That he was out of bounds, but he kept the foot in bounds. They review it. There's a lot of the way in there, a lot of the way. And as soon as they say it's a touchdown, he just goes out and celebrates. He's bringing a 
good energy. I hate to use the word good vibes, but he's bringing good vibes to this group. Why not? And it's what he yeah, does. No, exactly. Yeah. No, it's what he does. And honestly, college football yeah. needs that, especially when right. you're winning, when you're doing what they're doing, when the U, when UM's winning the way they're winning. Yes, it's a business mentality on this team. It's always win this week, focus on the next game, focus on what you need to do, yada, yada, yada. But you have to have fun while you're doing this as well. That's part of the game. They are, at the end of the day, they are still playing a game. They are still college students. And this team has really learned how to toe the line of having success, enjoying the success, but also to use the phrase that Mario Cristobal set has been using, they're still the right kind of mad, the right kind of angry, the right kind right. of knowing that the success has been good, but they can't rest on what they did last week. They have to focus on how they use that and apply it to what they're going to be doing next week. Well, tell me, tell me if I'm off on this because you know, obviously, you're right. You're you're in the middle of it every week now. But I feel like, I give an example. Like the turnover chain at the beginning was great. Yeah. But then the last couple of years, the last couple of years of it, when they weren't doing so well, mm -hmm. it kind of looked it kind of looked ridiculous when they were down in some games and they're and you're going crazy and so. But this team is celebrating. Don't get me wrong; they'll celebrate. Yeah. It doesn't seem like they're over celebrating. It's almost like they're a little more conscious of yeah. what each accomplishment means. Yes. So far. Yeah. And I, I get that just from reading body language, just from reading the way, like, yes, they get excited, but it's like, it's like an under control excited, which yeah. is good to see because it's like, all right, we know what we just did and kind of where it falls in, in terms of the, the pecking order of what we're trying to do here. Yeah, I would com agree with that completely. They're cognizant of what, of what's going on in relation to how they're going to react to it. So yeah. again, like again, Powell, both Powell's interceptions came in big moments. There were big celebrations with it. A lot of their touchdowns, especially early in games when they're starting to build their leads at the beginning, there'll be bigger, there'll be bigger celebrations. But as it's coming with more of a blow, it's more of an, okay, okay, fine. We sell, we touch, we, we score tap on the head, whatnot, let's get to the sidelines. But right. with that said, when the backups go in the game and they have the big plays, like I think about Emory Williams' touchdown to Elijah Lofton in the Ball State game, sideline goes nuts. Uh, right. Miles Moo Young, a walk-on, getting an interception to seal the USF game, sideline's going nuts because yeah. those guys don't get those chances. So right. they understand for when the veterans are making the big moves late in games that are already done with, they, they acknowledge it, but they don't go overboard. It's but, when it's the, but when there right. are the moments worth celebrating in the blowouts, yeah, they're going to have some fun. Right. How do you think they're taking this? Because you talked about, you, I think you mentioned it briefly earlier, but taking, the, I guess, the start with a grain of salt, too, in terms of the competition. Like, how are they handling that part of it? Because, again, 4 0 is great, but now you start to face your conference teams. And then, of course, you know, like there are some tests coming up uh, that are going to be much better. I mean, they, 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 as they should have, they handled at FAMU. They made Ball State look like a high school team out there. And, did what they had to do. They were in a, you know, they, it was challenging to a point against the Gators. It was challenging to a point against USF and they did what they needed to do. But how do you see them sort of staying grounded there? Like, you know, you're, you're talking to them all the time. I know in the access that you do get, but mm -hmm. how do you see them kind of that maturity level developing there? Talk a little more about that. Yeah. I mean, they're keeping everything business as usual. I mean, they, they're, they understand the wins and obviously, a win is a win regardless of the opponent. It's obviously much better than a loss, especially if, again, we look. We can look back to year one of Mario Cristobal's tenure, that middle Tennessee game, for example. They mm -hmm. had some games where they have played teams that they should easily handle that they didn't. So they're going to celebrate and acknowledge and recognize the wins as they come. But I think Cam Ward said it best after the USF game when he was asked where he stands and how he's staying mentally composed through after – what well, he's done through the first four games, he went, I'm doing good. But he goes, at the end of the day, now that we are where we are, these wins don't matter. ACC play starts Friday. That's when the schedule really begins. So they have they've looked at these first four games, obviously as competition, as competing in order to get the win, no matter who the opponent is, trying to use the quote-unquote nameless, nameless, faceless opponent. But once, the, once they kick off on Friday, once ACC play begins, where the games will dictate – whether they get to a conference championship game, which will also have the more important impact on if they get to their ultimate goal, which is the college football playoffs. Now is when we're going to start seeing everything kick up a notch in terms of, I mean, they've been focused throughout, but you're going to see a little extra focus, a little extra drive as they get through, get into these games. Yeah. Well, the last one of the last times they were in a primetime game similar to this against the conference opponent that they quote unquote should beat 
everybody knows what happened, and they would like to avoid such a snafu this season Correct. for sure. But uh, let's talk a bit about this Virginia Tech matchup. Um, and uh, starting with a, a, a family matchup here uh, as uh, Kyron Drones and Cam Ward cousins, as you wrote uh, this week in the Herald. Uh, Jordan, tell us a little bit about that matchup and some of the key things to look forward to against the Hokies. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, I asked Cam Ward about it uh, on Tuesday, and we talked to him a little bit about it back at AC football kickoff about his and Drones' relationship. They're cousins. They found out they were cousins Cam's junior year of high school. They're only a year apart in age. But, again, they trained together in Houston. They had the same quarterback coach during the offseason. And the chemistry is there. The friendship is there, except on Friday. They based Cam Ward's line at me at the ACC football kickoff was, yeah, we are going to stop our we're going to stop our acquaintance until after that Virginia Tech game. So they're going to be focused on everything. They're going to try to see who's the better of the two. Which, if the season this season any indication, we know who that what that answer is. <laughs> uh, but in terms of Virginia Tech, they're a veteran group. They've returned all but I think three or four starters from last year's team. They were expected to be a dark horse team in the ACC. Their non-conference schedule didn't go as well. They lost an overtime to Vanderbilt week one. They lost to Rutgers last week. They're two and two on the season, but they're pretty good in they're pretty good uh, get team on in the run game, which it's gonna that goes hand in hand against Miami. Uh, they have a top run offense. Miami is a top has one of the top rush defenses, so that's gonna be an interesting matchup to watch. And then also, it, and also when you look at their pass rush against Miami's offensive line. They're one of the top teams in terms of getting sacked. Let me actually pull up the exact numbers. I just wrote about this this morning. Uh, they have one of the top defensive lines. They have, I think, nine different guys who have recorded at least half a sack. So they have got enough guys who have the depth to make the pressure, to make pressure on the quarterback. But UM's offensive line has been one of the best in the country. Uh, yeah, their main guy, Richard defensive end, Antoine powell Ryland. He leads the country with six sacks this year. And VTech overall has 13 sacks tied for seventh nationally. But at, when you counter that with UM's offensive line, they've given up three sacks all year. And I believe one of those was when the second team defense was in, again, in I believe, the FAMU game. So the starting offensive line has – Cam Ward's only been sacked twice. Once in the Florida game, once in the FAMU game. Wasn't it all in Ball State, wasn't against USF. So – and again, those last three games without Jalen Rivers. So that's going to be an interesting matchup to watch. But – Overall, UM, I believe the line is UM by 19 and a half right now, which coincidentally enough is three giving UM three more points than they got for the USF matchup. The UF mm. UM was favored oh, by 16 game, and a half. Yeah, it's a home game also. So but so basically it about evens out. But still, UM is almost a 20 point favor against Virginia Tech team, which again, they're experienced, they're senior laden, but they haven't lived up to what most thought their potential would be going into the season, which was potentially being a dark horse for the ACC if everything went right. I believe I had them pegged as being, I believe, sixth or seventh in the 17-team conference. But they, right now, they're looking to correct themselves and get themselves back on track as they as they begin ACC play. Yeah. I mean, like you said, they, I think they should be that kind of favorite with what they've done so far. And mm -hmm. and it's not and it's not so much what they've done. I think when you look at the ACC right now, and that's the, the last thing we wanted to kind of like look here, look a, a peek a little bit ahead beyond the Hokies at what they might have coming up and look at the conference overall through the first month. I mean, FSU has fallen apart. I mean, I don't care that they won that game against Cal the other day. That was not, you know, they Cal is not very good. <laughs> they barely won that game. They're not scoring. They've been a big disappointment up in Tallahassee. They don't play Clemson unless they get them potentially in the ACC title game. So yes. when you look at that schedule right now, who can threaten this team outside of maybe that one road game at Louisville? They have a couple other I call be careful games where you don't want to let up and you want you have to show up. One of those could be Cal because you know when you look at rosters, Miami should definitely be a favorite, but it is a trip across the country. I can't remember the last time Miami played East Coast time at 1030. I mean, that's like a – I mean, maybe maybe back in the day when they played San Diego State on the West Coast when, you know, back in those days, but like in the late 80s. But since then, I don't remember Miami playing that late. But the trip itself to have to go out there, that's an interesting one. But that bye week that comes after that and then facing a team, a, a ranked opponent at Louisville, to me that's the one game that's kind of like the midway point. Like if they can get clear – they avoid any hiccups, get clear of that obstacle, then they're looking really good 
to potentially play for that ACC championship. Yeah, I completely agree. But I mean, when you look at, like you said, the three consecutive games, it's a Friday night game, a Saturday night game where it's going to be the first ACC after dark because that's going to yeah. be a thing now. Right. And then, and then you see West. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And then just UM's history with coming off by by weeks and it being on the road against potentially their toughest game. And again, right. they're two, they're two games after buys this year. If I remember correctly, it's at Louisville. And I believe their Georgia tech game on the road is also after a buy. That's one of those. Be careful. Games, so yeah. Sure. So yeah. But when you look at it, if they can weather through these first three, they knock on wood. Uh, and actually I've got to correct myself. The, by the George Tech game is before their bye week. So let me correct okay. myself there. Okay. But still, either, either way, that's, either a, that's way. a be careful game. Georgia yeah. Tech on the road is a be careful game. For, for but, the record, I like yeah. that one. And I think if, especially if they're undefeated still by that point, the Syracuse game at the finish line is another one that, because it's a road game. Yeah, that will be yeah. that will be an interesting one to follow. Uh, but when you look through it, they can get through these first three. They get yeah. through Virginia Tech, through, my, through Cal, and through Louisville. The rest of their schedule, they have home against FSU, which, as we as we said, the fighting Mike Norvells are really not fighting right now. Uh, not, on, not on offense, anyway. No, not on offense. Uh, Manny Diaz is homecoming with Duke, which, by the way, shout out Blue Devils, 4-0 yeah. right now. I was gonna, yeah, you're right. I forgot four, about the Manny Diaz bowl. 4-0 <laughs> against 4 no for Manny Diaz at Duke. And yeah. right now, that might be the top team in North Carolina among the ACC teams. I mean, we well, saw Duke. UNC getting the 70 to 50 against James Madison. NC yeah. State is two and NC State's two and two. They got clobbered by Clemson. Oh, that As, James Madison game. That was every every other pass by North Carolina yeah. was an interception in that game. I mean, yeah, 53 no, I, I, by halftime. Yeah, no, I was watching that game. It was I was watching the early games before going to the UM USF game. UM Mississippi State was on the main screen with, at the at the restaurant I was watching at which Again, I think I may have seen Florida's last last win under Billy Napier by watching yeah. that game. But yeah. I, as I was going through the screens, UNC and James Madison was all the way on the far right. I just found myself keep craning my neck over and looking, going, they scored again? They scored again? I thought wait, they were going to get the wait, 60 at score? halftime. Yeah, I really thought too. they were going to get the 60 at halftime. And, and if too. they hadn't, I think they threw an interception of their own. If not, they would have. Yeah. Yeah. So. But when you look at it, after those three main games, Home against FSU, home against Duke, at Georgia Tech, home Wake Forest, at Syracuse. Right. The young face Clemson, as you said. Louisville is really the only, in terms of Louisville and Cal are really the only two games that on paper yeah. should worry Hurricanes fans in any way. And that's just because of, again, just the nature of the logistics with Cal and right. Louisville being the ranked matchup and knowing Miami's history after bye weeks. One, but, one tiny one yeah. tiny thing before you keep going about the, about yeah. Duke. Ironically enough, they play North Carolina this week. They host yes. them. So Manny Diaz's team could be 5-0 and at that point. And if you look at their schedule, they have a couple of tests before they would face Miami. They have Georgia Tech. They have SMU at home. They have the Seminoles. For what it's worth, they probably should be favored in that game the way the Seminoles are playing. But but Miami, you know, Miami will be fa- – Miami FSU game, you know how it is. Both teams get up, but looking at the way that FSU has played on offense, I can't see them doing much of anything unless there's a, a – and, and honestly, coming from someone who worked up there a few years ago, even if they made a move at quarterback, I don't know if they have anything behind yeah. DJ Ugalele yeah, that but the thing is, is and also, it's, and also honestly, it's not just no. And it's not just DJ's fault. I mean, the offensive – Line isn't giving him much time. No, his and now they lost one of their top. They, Roydell yeah. Williams is out too. They lost one of their top yeah. backs too. So, yeah. and neither of their lines of scrimmage are doing anything. Right, their defense line is supposed to be really good is barely doing anything. Their it's offensive some, line is some, giving them time. Right, it's some yeah. linebacker play. Patrick Payton's making some plays, yeah. but overall, it's a big drop off. I mean, you could almost. I mean, you know, you know, we're getting too ahead of ourselves in yeah. that matchup. We'll have a, we'll have an episode down the road about all about FSU, obviously, but. Yeah. But, yeah, but, but again, I think, just I think, UM, back, I think UM, is, UM fans are salivating for that game for, right yes. now for some payback for the last yeah. few years. Yeah. So, but just overall with the, the ACC schedule, the fact that again, Louisville is going to be the only ranked opponent they face most likely this season until if they make the ACC playoffs, which again, the way the conference is looking, it's probably going to be Clemson. They got spanked week one by Georgia, but then, but again, any team who played Georgia week one was probably not going to win that game. So the fact that Georgia or the fact that Clemson has corrected itself and has looked like what Clemson usually looks like since then, 
makes me think, again, makes me think it's going to be one or the other between Miami and Clemson in terms of winning the ACC. That's just where I'm looking at right now as we get into ACC play. Yeah. And if Miami is undefeated going into conference, again, this is me getting really ahead of myself, just thinking college football playoff-wise. Again, we have the 12-team field this year. So it's not just you have to win, basically run the table and win the conference to get in. If even if Miami is able to do it, handle its schedule, regardless of what happens in the ACC championship game, Miami should have a chance. Miami looks like it's setting itself up for a top 12 spot. Yes. If they, yes. It's but, not a guarantee, but no matter what, winning yeah. is obviously the the guarantee to get in is the key. Yeah. But again, if if you're an 11-1 team in the conference runner-up, that that should get you in. Stress should. should. But yes. when you look at the – unfortunately, when you look at Miami's schedule overall and yeah. it, and and through no fault of their own, just yeah. circumstances when you – I mean, I mean, a, a drop-off by FSU hurt the conference. It does. It hurts the conference because now the strength of schedule, even if Miami runs the table 11-0 and going into that game, if they lose that game, they're going to be on the bubble. They probably shouldn't be, but they're going to be on the bubble because the strength of schedule is not going to be in their favor overall because – other than the Louisville game, other than that last game, there's not a lot. There's not yeah. a lot because of the way that a lot of teams in this conference have underperformed so far this season, and that hurts. I mean, but yeah, I mean, I yeah. they're thinking twelve and zero. They're thinking yeah. get in and then do as much damage and make a run for it and try to win it all. But yeah, I I, I see your point, but I, I don't know yeah. that, that strength of schedule and yeah. and and the way even with twelve teams, it scares me yeah. because of the way it, it could turn out. But right now, yeah. You know, narrowing the focus. Let's see how this team handles a Friday night home game against yes. the conference foe, and that's that's just the next step in the evolution of this team. Correct, correct. And again, it's going to be an interest. It's going to be a key start to their season. And then again, the bright side for them, obviously, it's a short week this week. But having that extra day of rest, especially with having cross go cross country next week, if they can handle their business this week, it gives them that extra sense of chance uh, or their extra chance for preparation going into what's going to be that Cal that Cal game next week. Look, this team has in recent years not handled logistical challenges very well. Like you said, bye weeks, road trips, that sort of thing. Are they different this year? They look different. They definitely look way different in a good in a good way. Now we're going to find out. These next yeah. this ne this next month is all about that part of yeah. it. Are we? And the other out? part to factor in with Cal, this is that's going to be their first game outside of the state of Florida this year. Right. So again, they yeah. were at in Gainesville, in Tampa, and in three home games. Right. So when they look through that, which again, that's looking ahead to next week, and we'll talk a lot more about that next week. But again, yeah. your first game outside of your state, yeah. being six weeks into the season, and oh yeah, three time zones away, right. and a night game there. Right. Well, that's going to be, yeah, yeah. it's going to be interesting to see. Oh, and even, and again, that Louisville game, that's, that's a tough place to play too, especially if they were to, you know, if they decide to put that, let's say it ends up being a night game, yeah. which it could be. I mean, if they, especially if Louisville by that point of the season is still undefeated and Miami's still undefeated, I don't see why it wouldn't be. I mean, it, it yes. could even, heck, it could even be a top 10 matchup by then. You never know. I mean, if likely, Louisville's, yeah. Louisville's fifteenth right now. Maybe they creep up a little bit more, or be pretty darn close. I mean, yeah. So that that's going to be a, a, definitely a challenge of the maturity and the development to see where this team is at, and a test to see if this team really truly can contend. You know, not only for a conference title, but potentially in the playoffs. So, but uh, we just want to thank everybody that's watching and that has watched and uh, listened to us as well. Remember, you can catch us on YouTube. You can catch us at MiamiHerald.com. And um, good to have this show back. It's been a while, and I, uh, I know it's been since last season pretty much, and um, we hope that, to, that you'll join us throughout the rest of the journey for the Hurricanes, for the U, the rest of the year. Uh, from one, uh, fr from uh, someone who has enjoyed working with Jordan in the past on these things, looking forward to it. And uh, Jordan, anything else to say before we sign off for this week? No, I feel like we covered everything. I'm glad to be over here doing this beat. Uh, it's been a... Pretty interesting first couple months uh, getting back into the grind of college football compared to what I was doing with the Marlins and what I've been doing with other beats since I've been around. But again, excited to be here. I know I have big shoes to fill replacing the legend in, in SMD, <laughs> but hoping I'm doing the good enough job to be able to 
to to carry the to carry the torch in proper fashion. It'll be good. It's a good time to join and see 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 how this team does. Exciting times. It's been a while. It's been a, a little bit. Um, I know a few years ago Miami had that ten and zero run before it collapsed at the end. This feels a little different. This feels like this is something the start of something sustainable for a while for the Hurricanes. Let's see if they can keep it going. Uh, but we'll be we'll be around uh, on a weekly basis now to document that for you. Again, thanks for watching. Eye on the U. We'll see everybody next week.